Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is Lessons for Full Spectrum Humans, the second semester of 2018. Today is June 20th. Um, happy summer solstice. And we are beginning the teaching cycle from the beginning now. So for anyone who has been curious, who has wanted to know, what am I talking about when I talk about, here, I'll move a light so you can see this a little bit better. What am I talking about when I talk about this thing? What am I, what am I doing? What is all of this? It's, it's kind of like hard to jump in to some, to some TV series right in the middle. What is this all about? I'm happy to share with you from the beginning what this is all about. Oh, that, and Cheryl is saying, um, she's thanking me for changing the scheduling from Thursdays to Wednesdays. So yes, if you're watching this recorded already on YouTube, then it might not be um, uh, germane to your experience. However, if you are a weekly participant and you want to know when the live webinars are going, last semester it was Thursday afternoons at 3 p.m. Pacific. Now it is Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Pacific. And I did a poll for all the lovely people because I was joking on the Facebook intro. We have literally participants in Australia, uh, Latvia, France, um, um, Netherlands, like if I'm forgetting anyone, please forgive me, but and United States and you know Canada. We have people all over the place, which is really, really wonderful. So I'm, I'm so happy that many different people tune in also because like if it was just a question of finding people in one's immediate vicinity, like Christine, who's a long-term you know, participant here, she lives one town over, but that would be like I'm one person in my neighborhood that I could talk about lasagna with. So it's really pretty important and wonderful and special that we're able to use technology for something uplifting that we can actually um, connect together. I joke about the human mycelium, but that's really what we are doing. Mycelium being the um, branching root-like structure underneath fungi that transports nutrients and energy and ideas to all, and it, it works plants, it's like a plant network. We are a human mycelium and we are connecting together and sharing these wonderful ideas. And so I also you know, say part of my motivation for sharing these flying rainbow lasagna ideas is that I found them helpful and beneficial in my life. Literally, it's how I'm here as a star person. P.S. This is the introduction. And if you're new, so and I, but I see so many people that are familiar. But if, for anyone who has just joined the class, because I have a couple of very new students, first of all, welcome, and I'm so happy that you found this. And um, someone actually asked me, I think, in one of the chats, is it too late? Like Aurora, is it too late for me to learn to fly in rainbow lasagna? Is there some kind of ascension event or something like that? First of all, I'm like, wow, like don't pressure yourself because it's not that type of a thing. Sometimes I have likened this to a spiritual battle, but what I really think of it more, I was just looking at my foot rest down there. Sorry, I'm shaking things too. I really look at it not just like a spiritual battle, but like a giving birth. And birth is not something, I mean, I know in modern day hospitals, what a lot of doctors do is they say, well, you know, you're scheduled to be born on this day, or, you know, we're going to induce you, or we're going to do something surgical or whatever like that. Like, I know that modern medicine likes to try to control the birth process, but in more traditional times, it was like the baby came and the baby came. So that's how each one of us, I feel, should approach our inner development. And this is also like growth as a musician. You know, when you're trying to learn and to grow as a musician, you know, it's like it doesn't really help to be beaten about the head and be like, try harder, try it. Like that doesn't make you more of a genius like Mozart. You have to let that music unfold from within or any creative expression or, you know, real, true, like love expression. So this is what we're engaged in. We're engaged in a love, a cosmic love making individual, you know, with the uh, larger cosmos and the time field, and also personal transformation and development from being a more limited shape, which is this toroidal shape. And P.S., when I say limited, like there's nothing wrong with this shape because everyone's like Saturn, the rainbow, the black cube, the matrix, get, get me out of the matrix. Like, first of all, I understand completely the feelings of frustration because what has happened is the original genetic program or intention for behavior of DNA has been subverted. So everyone who's using DNA, everyone that's here in these bodies, including plants and animals and the entire planet herself, everything has been limited and constrained and is feeling not very happy because it's not allowed to dance and move in its natural patterns. So it's just like, imagine if you were born into some family where they were like super, super strict, you know, like some very, whatever I'm trying to, I don't know, like what, you know, social, but like a very strict family where it's like no dancing, no singing, no movement. No, you must stand at attention like this at all times. Like that is what it has been like for us as humans to be in these bodies. And so also 
you know, I'm a visitor. All right, I'm a star person. I'm from the stars and the network of stars and literally like a network of light and consciousness and that I don't travel in a plank plank metal spaceship. What I travel upon, we could call it wings of light or we could call it um, beams of consciousness, you know, um, energy, like pure energy. And it's an intangible. So for everyone who's like the search for intelligent life, you know, like, like they're, they're looking out like with the telescope and they're looking for clank, clank metal spaceships. Like you'll find them out there, but you will only find a very limited slice of consciousness of the beings um, that are the ones that have to use technology to fly from location to location. And me and a lot of other beings we don't use technology to fly from location to location. And my way of transiting here into this body into a body with a mouth so that I could share these ideas using the English language or make sculptures and paintings in a physical sense that could be perceived by other people. Like, that's my mission. That's why I'm here. Why did I come here? Why are we here? Why are, why are you here? And this is like, this is important because I literally used to stand on, you know, the sidewalk with us flying rainbow lasagna and just try to talk to people about it. And it's like, if you have a cupcake or you have some delicious lasagna on a plate and you just want to give it to people like here, like, look, I made some good food, eat it. They're going to be suspicious. They're like, well, what's in that? Who are you? Why are you offering this to me? Like, I didn't understand. I'm just so wanting to share this lasagna food with all of humanity that I didn't understand. You got to have backstory. So everyone rest assured. I have backstory. Look, I live in a house. I have an address. I have a driver's license. I have all these things. I'm part of humanity. And yeah, but I'm a visitor. I'm not the original occupant of this body. And that's a big distinction to make. And I'm not a body snatcher or some kind of negative evil walk-in because I've had to learn that those beings exist too. I didn't, again, I didn't force my way onto this planet and force my way into this body. What I did was like beautiful partnership. When you are playing your music and then someone else is playing their beautiful music and it sounds beautiful together. So that is what I did as a stellar being into this physical body vibrated the DNA in a new shape that I invented that had never been done before. This is my contribution. So wait, let me drink a little bit of water. I know I'm, I'm, I'm giving, getting into level one stuff. Level one stuff is this language that is called the interdimensional language of color, line, shape, form, movement, texture, and tone, and tone being musical tone. So uh, I didn't invent that language. And I kept on trying to think like for in preparation for today's class, how shall I phrase that? Because I, I as Aurora, let's just say this, that language, that organizational principle that you can see in some of my paintings here, and I'll bring up some other paintings for you to look at too, that organizational principle was in existence before I became Aurora in this body. So I would have to dilate my identity to being the great composer, the divine being, the one who created all this, which the truth is, that's true. It's true of all of us. Like if each one of us dilated our identity, like if you pan back far enough, it's like, wait, I'm every, you are everything. You are everything. And that's really the spoiler alert. That's really the, the, the thing that we find out. We find out I am God. I am God, not just me, but you and you and you. Every single being that is in existence recognizes I am God. And that is the, the final denouement that we're all heading for. So there are different layers to our being. There, are, there's a structure to time. This time structure relates to our physical body structure. So what I, so, and also what I present in this class, first of all, level one, I'm gonna stick more closely to the recorded lessons, I think. Level one, this is all about the shape, this interdimensional vibratory language. Because if you are trying to talk to beings from another time and place, mostly they don't speak English. Mostly they speak a language of, pure vibration. One of the things I like about that movie, Close Encounters, is that they are using music and also like flashing colored lights in order to form a rapport with beings that don't use English. So the, the truth is, we're being spoken to all the time, all the time, literally time, in a language that is not the language of English. And it is a language of color, line, shape, form, movement, texture, and tone. And our bodies are also part of that language, not separate. So let me go now to the screen share. Wait, let me get my magic trackpad, my magic over here, and go to screen share and start talking with pictures. Because I always say, pictures worth a thousand words. Pictures worth a thousand of the flapping of my moving mouth parts. Okay, and so let me also just make sure that you guys can see, oops, just checking the chat over here. 
someone just confirm for me, if you will, that you can actually see the images that I'm pulling up right now. And I'll drink a little bit of water because this is like running a marathon. Can you guys see my screen share okay? Good, wonderful, thank you, Gala. That helps me out so much. Because like technology, I'm never sure if techno gremlins or, or uh, whatever give me a problem. So okay, this painting over here that I'll scribble on top of here, they had a color to scribble. This painting over here that I'm scribbling on top of is named Merkaba Chakra One. And it's not just two cool words that, you know, are like catchphrases uh, put together. They're, they're, these are, so what does chakra mean and what does Merkaba mean? So chakra means spinning wheel of energy. That is exactly what these sculptures are that I make. I'll hold it super close to the camera so you can see these are spinning wheels of energy. And they are literally time spinning within itself. So you can start to see, I'm just holding these up. These are also part of what we'll do in level two. Oops, 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 oops. Part of what we're doing in level two. I'll get to this one. Can we, uh, hold on a second. I'm gonna move this painting, there we go. This is the line drawing for the painting that I just showed you. Ah, yes, Roxana says of this, it looks like a sliced image of a piece of DNA under a microscope. How wonderful that you just brought that up because I actually have that image available in my meticulously organized, uh, here we go, class lectures. I'm squinting and scrolling and making funny faces. Go to here, there we go, this, as Roxana has stated, is a picture of DNA. So if I annotate this, here we go. This hole that I'm pointing into, that's like the tunnel looking down the center of DNA. And then this is all of the coiling of the genetic material going kind of like a spring like that. And that DNA goes through various levels of coiling that are called supercoiling. And we'll go more into that in subsequent lessons. Like that's actually getting a little bit into advanced level stuff. And I'm gonna stick to the, uh, stick to my intentions for saying this is um, the introduction to what are the chakras and what what is our relationship to time here let me get a few more things okay so wait this uh, let me get one more really great picture for you to just show you what what are chakras boom so I use this image quite a lot this image is highly accurate in some respects and not totally accurate in other respects. So it's highly accurate in terms of the proportions of what we're seeing here. Look at how big and giant this big red circle is. I can't draw a perfect circle with this thing, but that big red circle that I'm attempting to highlight, that's a big, giant, big ass circle. And this circle is half the size of that big circle, the orange circle. This is all correct in terms of its proportions. So, okay, said this in the Facebook intro. The re why, Aurora, why the rainbow? What is this all about? This is part of that language, that interdimensional language. So for us, you know, we perceive visually using color and we perceive auditorily and we have um, divided up into notes on the scale. So, okay, when I first, on my, in my personal journey, I first perceived these truths through my anthropomorphic filter of understanding it by color because the, my closest training was visual artistry. And it, many, many years later, I started to understand these expressions of the language of vibration or harmonics through auditory vibrations also. So first I'll go through the visual and we'll do the auditory um, one more in subsequent lessons. Basically music and visual, you know, light waves and sound waves, they are both doing the same thing. And so all of this stuff that I'm scribbling on over here, everything that's not the anthropomorphic or one headed, two armed, two legged figure in this painting, this is all time. So you can see there's a person over here and that person is surrounded by all of this stuff that is actually made up out of time. That is what is referred to when we talk about chakras. Let me drink some more water here. Chakra comes from Sanskrit. It means spinning wheel. Sanskrit, this is the language of India. So if I highlight these chakras here, that one right there and that one right there. Wow, those look exactly like tires on a chariot. Like, look, we could draw like a little, uh, you know, like the little place where the charioteer sits. And this is the axle going through the chariot. And then here's the reins that go to a horse. And then the horse pulls the chariot along. The, the word chakra in Sanskrit um, came from the time when a, a, a triumphant 
um, a person who had conquered lands was a charioteer and they could roll through that land without being shot at, all right? So that's the whole idea, that these are like your, your chariots that you use to roll through the fabric of time, space, and consciousness. What I'm circling and scribbling upon, this is the fabric of time, space, and consciousness. And in exactly the same way that if you have like a whirling, swirling amount of water, you can make a vortex of water, or a whirling, swirling amount of atmosphere, you can make a tornado. What we have here is whirling and swirling time that makes a vortex of time. And when I draw what I call the time field, or you know, this, this uh, simplification, because this is the very first lesson of the class so that everybody is starting like from the first page of the book, I'm trying to draw this also like more neatly than I usually am able to do it on the computer. So I draw this time vortex down here at the bottom where I'm kind of, you know, highlighting with my pen. And that is like, one lifetime. This is really crucial because, okay, I, didn't, I, I haven't taken a huge survey of all of the other teachers that are in existence in the world, but let's say I, from the people that I've been exposed to so far, a lot of people talk about chakras, but they just show them as in, indistinct glowing balls of energy and shows them, uh, choose a different color for a moment. Um, here, uh, choose a blue color. It shows them aligned along the spine, like one down here, and then another one over here, and then another one over here, and then another one over here, and another one here, and another one here. And I have several paintings that are like that. That's what I talk about, them being more accurate in terms of where the convergence points of each chakra align with on your spine. So in this painting, what I have done is turned it all into a shorthand, and I show them all converging at this one central big blue dot that I'm highlighting there. Technically, that's not totally accurate. So this is like if I was making an anatomy textbook and I was showing, oh, the circulatory system and we have, you know, the heart and then things generally circulate from the heart and back to the heart, but I'm not drawing every branching capillary and totally, uh, um, you know, in total accuracy. So when I, when I show a like all of these paintings that I do, I do them for, for didactic purposes. Like I want them to be beautiful, but I also want them to be accurate. Oh, I'm drinking water here. And you know, I stand behind them just like if you do a doctorate that someone's gonna ask you, well, what did you mean when you said this on page 34? And you have to be prepared to stand behind it and say, oh, I meant this. When I do these visual images, I am doing the same level of self-expression. And I chose to be an artist, a visual artist, as opposed to writing scientific white papers because nobody has to peer review this image. No one has to allow me to publish it or make it. Like I make it according to my own standards. And all of my paintings, they get more and more accurate the, the more adept I become at expressing these abstract empirical truths through painting. And that this is the, that this is another point that I'm trying to bring up here, that these are abstract empirical truths. So again, I'm not making up these proportions. These proportions exist, and I feel very comfortable telling you all, hey guys, these are the proportions of light in the cosmos. These are the proportions of light that come from our nearest star. These are the proportions of light that are part of our non-physical body. Like, I feel very comfortable, to, it's not merely my opinion is what I'm trying to say. Like, these are just basic facts. And all of these facts in my presentation are intended to be uh, empowering. None of what I'm saying here, I'm just getting some more water for myself, is intended to be like, oh, forget, abandon hope, all ye who enter here, nothing can be done, sit there and just, you know, take it and just, you know, just be beaten about the head and shoulders. Like, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is here's information, here's the ideal of what's supposed to be going on, here's what's actually going on, and then here's the solution, which is flying your bullets on you. So that, just stick with me. And that's that little expression there is for everyone who is, you know, just new and who's just getting on board because I know that there are a lot of people who have already been on board for a long time and who are seeing that like it all, it builds, we're going somewhere with this. And it's cumulative, just like when you're learning music, like first you learn a basic chord and then you learn a more complex chord, you know, and then you learn many complex chords all strung together. So this is cumulative knowledge. So this painting that I'm showing you right here is accurate the, the central convergence point that I'm pointing at right over there is a visual shorthand that is not totally accurate, but it is highly accurate in terms of the color proportions. So starting from the beginning, we have, even though I'm not changing my, my pen color, where I'm highlighting out here, this is red. Red is the largest frequent, longest wavelength 
and it is the largest proportion in terms of color proportion. So we've got, and we'll also do it with the, with the notes on the scale too. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And then we would go to white light, white light. Because when we have white light that comes from the sun, Saul, Saul, we're living in the solar system. Our sun's name is Saul. And Saul's light is actually yellowish green. But if we take that light, we've calibrated to it to say, oh, that yellowish green light is white light. And we do this in our, it's funny, we've created all of our technology that does the same thing. Like you need to white balance. Your camera looks at this and says, okay, this is white. So we're going to say this is white and everything around it is based upon that presumption. And we do that with our eyes too. For example, if you go outside to like a parking lot at night where all the lights are sodium vapor lights and have a very pink look to them. And someone that you know is wearing a white shirt, even though you look at that white shirt, even though it looks pink in the sodium vapor light, you and your system of interpretation will interpret it as white. So white is the accumulation of all of these colors. This is because of additive color mixing. So there's two different types of color mixing. Wait, let me grab some paint. Where's some paint down here? Okay, sorry, I'm ducking off camera. This is some actual paint that is made out of pigments. And when I made this, this color, what I was using was subtractive color mixing. That means that when I mix together pigments, the resulting amount of light that can escape and hit your eyeball is because of subtractive color mixing, all the other frequencies that we cut out. And that's different than if you're adding colors together, like if you were adding laser lights together or some kind of stage production where you have projections of different colored lights. And also certain printing processes that involve uh, layering transparent inks that also are additive color mixing because in those circumstances, red plus orange plus yellow plus green plus blue plus indigo plus violet equals white light. And that's like our origin, our origin of consciousness, where we're coming from, from the sun and from the stars. So uh, just your physical body comes from the sun and the stars. The calcium in your bones is the end, and many of the other atomic elements of your body are the end result of the death explosion, like the exploding supernova at the end of another star's life. Not this star that we're under right now, but a different star a long, long time ago. Poof, uh, poofed out all that wonderful good stuff that made it possible to have these you know, uh, atomic elements in your physical body. And also on this planet that we're on right now, everything that we have in terms of uh, mental consciousness energy, food energy, warmth, the capacity to have biological life, it all derives from emanations from the sun. So you're literally made from the sun and the stars. This is like total, and science will back me up on all of these things. Um, oh, okay, thank you for telling me that. Gallet told me that she's just able to see, she's, you guys aren't able to see me in the thumbnail, you're only able to see the, the pictures. Okay, so don't worry, I'm, I'm sorry if I was gesturing in a way that you couldn't see. Um, we are this here, this guy that's in here, this anthropomorphic person in the center there. You are the end result recipe of red plus orange plus yellow plus green plus great, I'm up to green plus blue plus indigo plus violet. When you add together all of these different layers of self, it adds up to you. This is a big takeaway here from today's lesson. If there's one takeaway, it's that you're much, much more than merely your red, orange, and yellow layers, because for about the past 5,000 years, that is what humanity has been defined as. Red, this is a physical body. You're red, you have a physical body. Hey, you know something, we can all touch, we can touch it, we can poke it, I'm touching my shoulder. Everybody can touch their physical body. Physical body definitely exists. And orange, this is mammalian emotions. This is like anger, hatred, sorrow, the things that make you cry, the things that make you kill other people, you know, animosity, literally animosity. Those things all exist. It's like the animal emotions. And then on top of that, a thin layer of human consciousness, you know, the human hacked operating system. So for about all of recorded human history, that's what humanity has been defined as, your physical body with mammalian emotions and then a thin smear of human intellectual consciousness on top of that. And all of this other stuff. Oh, Pedro is asking why only negative animal emotions? Because everything that's in the orange layer is an emotion that has been slowed down from the original emanation, which is actually here in the green layer, which is love. And the emotions that we're feeling here, and again, this is, there's nothing wrong with them. There's some, we're kind of you know, in this level of reality and of existence where it can be very effective to have anger because anger is like a pushing away 
of something that something angers you or a person angers you, maybe they're trying to like attack you or hurt you, that the anger that you feel inside helps to give you a power to push them away or for you to run away from them. So, uh, you know, a lot of these um, emotions that are uh, in this level here, it's also the level of attraction, mammalian attraction. Like, why do some mommies want to be with some daddies? Because they're attracted on a mammalian level, and that's part of reproduction. And that can be a necessary, good part of our emotions. But just be aware that these emotions, they are distortions or diminished aspects of the true emotion, which is unconditional love. And unconditional love doesn't necessarily mean you want to hug everything or everyone in the world. Unconditional love is a tone. Tone that you make with your body when you fly through time at one moment per moment. So if each one of these is a little box of time, you make this tone of unconditional love when you are jumping at exactly the right rate through all of these boxes of time. And you're not clinging to the past, you're not anticipating the future, you're in the moment. So all a lot of these uh, emotions here, they are not pure love, and love does not necessarily mean romantic attraction or that you want to hug and kiss. That's a big one. It's cosmic love that I'm talking about. Um, humans are much more than merely a body with mammalian emotions and then ruled over by a, a human conscious intellect. Humans also have what I define as the higher faculties, everything that is love and above. And I have other pictures that I'll go into this and I talk about the higher faculties a lot. It's unconditional love, which is like foundation here. So put that foundation in a different direction like the foundation, like the foundation of a pyramid. And then all of these other layers of understanding and perception are layered on top of that foundation of love. So at first you learn how to do meditation and mindfulness, move through time at the right rate. Mm, I'm making the love noise now. Mm. Okay, so now you're moving through time at the right rate. That means you've got your foundation spinning over here. And now you're ready to start balancing the next layers of perception on top of them. And the next layers of perception are, so wait, we did, I didn't, I didn't do this in a very sensible way. So this is red, the, the physical realm. This is orange mammalian emotions. This is yellow, what humans define as and self-identify as self. This is the ego layer, and the ego layer is highly distorted in this time and place. So that's a challenge because it's not your true ego. It's the, the human operating system has been hacked. It's a hacked operating system, so everyone is not necessarily running their programming. I'm not a transhumanist, but just using these vocabulary words in the way that it was designated. This, where I'm highlighting right now, green, the level of unconditional love, which is where all the, the green is actually at the center of the chest there. That green is a tone that you make when you move through time at the right rate. And it's also like a central clearinghouse because all of the energy that's coming from the top uh, higher dimensional, less dense realms into the lower dimensional, more dense realms comes through the heart. And similarly, all of the energy that's coming from down here and down here, lower, lower vibration, it's a lower note, but it's not a worse note. It's just a lower note. Because everyone thinks, oh, I'm stuck in the lower vibration. That's so horrible down here. No, it's not meant to be horrible down here. De facto, it is horrible, but it's not intended to be horrible. So, but yeah, it's like the lower notes. Those are not worse notes, but they are distorted in this time and place. The physical realm is distorted, but we do have energy that is going from the lower dimensional, more dense realms, and it is being refined upwards into the higher dimensional, less dense realms. And that also goes through the heart chakra. So wait, I'm not done with doing, doing the scale of music and the what, what are the chakras and what they each signifies, but I do want to uh, emphasize this pathway right here from the lower dimensional realm upward through the time field to that convergence point. I make this drawing all the time. Now that you new people are in this class, you will see me do this drawing down here all the, all the darn time, all, all the live long day, many, many, many times, because this is um, a shorthand for our journey through time. And that central tent pole, that path of least likelihood that I just drew there is the intended pathway for our consciousness, not all of this other stuff that I'm scribbling around over here, not all that peripheral stuff, but just the central stuff. So wait, back, so when we do this successful journey from lower dimensional to higher dimensional, we have to go through this opening or aperture that is known as the heart. 
it's just like your eyes. Like in order to have light come into your eyes, you have to have your eyeballs open. That's what that means. So when someone says open your chakras, like, I, I mean, I don't even know what they mean, but I'm, I think that what the admonishment is, is to, you know, um, focus your energy fields so that energy can travel through them effectively. So that aperture of unconditional love is a crucial doorway to have open so that your other higher faculties can function. Those other higher faculties include turquoise, that's the level of the throat, and that's communication. And communication can be in terms of visual, paint like paintings, something that you say with words, a gesture, an interpretive dance, um, you know, a, a signal, a sign language, anything that is a communicative stuff and it, it emanates outward from your throat and it involves anything that you do with your arms and your hands. So even like weaving a basket, that can be considered, or weaving cloth, that can be considered a type of communication. And on top of there is indigo or dark blue, which is insight. That's the level of pure insight that is understanding not clothed with words. So in order to get clothed with words, you go to turquoise. When you want to get unclothed, you, it's like unwrapping a package. Oh, well, look, I got this package in the mail. I unwrapped the outside of it, and then here's what's inside the package. The words are the wrapping. The words are the wrapping paper. And the concept is what is inside of the box, and that concept resides at the level of indigo, which is pure insight. And then the final level, the final layer is violet. And violet is our connection to higher dimensional, less dense realms. That is like where we plug in to the higher dimensional power station. So once again, we are full spectrum humans. Everyone in this class is a full spectrum. I mean, everyone has the potential to be a full spectrum human. I'm giving special, um, um, whatever, uh, acknowledgement to everyone who's in this class who's cultivating themselves drinking water. Because it takes self-cultivation to move beyond those first three layers that humanity has been um, pinned within or constrained within for a very long time. So it used to be the idea that when you reach this layer of green, that was like the le le lesson of attainment. You know, if you were a yogi and you meditated on a mountaintop for a, a long time, I want to say a million years, a long time, many decades, or if you, you know, did prostrations and you were a pilgrim, if you did all the right things, then you might get to be at the level of unconditional love. This is, you know, humanity telling this story. And I'm, I come here, I'm like, no, what? No, 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 no. That unconditional love is our birthright. That all the babies that come in, every, when we first came here, we were first little children, that's who we're supposed to be. That's who we are on an innate level. And then, of course, m most people become drawn as askew when they begin to have this uh, human operating system, human mind implanted within them. The human mind is hacked. It's not, it doesn't act correctly. It's, the, it's like software that's glitchy. It doesn't do the right thing. So when this human mind starts to get implanted through language, through babies learning how to speak, through babies learning, uh, interacting with their caregivers, you know, their mommies and their daddies and their family who give them all of these ideas that are distorted ideas, then what it starts to do is it starts to make this aperture close down. And that's why everybody doesn't necessarily have these higher faculties activated. So way back in Atlantis, everybody had their higher faculties activated. That was what was normal. Being able to see through time, that's normal. Oh, did I tell you your insight? Your insight is how you see through time. Hold on. Your insight is how you see through time. So wait, I'm going to talk about the actions of the anatomy, what, what this anatomy is doing, and then also I want to talk about the proportions. So before I get to what the anatomy is doing, let me talk about proportions, wavelength and, and frequency. So wavelength and frequency, this is science talk. And uh, what it refers to is you can see this is a big giant arc. That's the, the red, red wavelength. The length of the wave is a big, long ass wave. And in our world, we understand, oh, I'll get to that, that question, Salu. Um, we make things that you can see red from the longest, for, from the furthest away. Like if this is your eyeball over here, you can see red wavelengths from the furthest away. That's why we make stop signs red, fire engines are red. That's why berries are red in nature because uh, animals, most mammals, can see them from far away as opposed to blue. Wait, I'm gonna choose a different color. Blue, blue light waves do not travel as well. They are shorter wavelengths and they disperse more easily. There is much less blue food than there is red food. So the whole point is wavelength and frequency. So if I say, if, like if this is the, uh, the edge of a shoreline right here, like on ocean on the beach, 
And this is a, I'm not changing my color of my pen, but just imagine this is a red wave. There's one red wave that goes and can crash on the beach like that. And in the same amount of time that it takes for that one, here I should just make it red already. Here's the red, so you can see what I'm doing there. In the same amount of time that it takes for that red to crash one wave on the beach, it can actually crash two oranges onto the beach, two orange wavelengths. The orange, free, uh, orange wavelength is half the size. I don't know if you can see that line. So in all my paintings, my, um, my red wavelengths are 12. My orange wavelengths are always six. Here, let's draw it so you can see it. 12 inches is for red, six inches is for orange. That's because six is half of 12. If we made the red frequency, the red wavelength rather, 10 inches long, then my orange wavelength would be five inches long. Whatever red is, orange is always half of red. I didn't make that up. That, this comes directly from the sun. If you have any issues with it, please take it up with the sun and the stars. Be like, I don't know why these proportions are this way. Why are they this way? I didn't make them this way, unless I dilate my personality to say that I am God and I am God. But as a were, I didn't make them this way. So if you have any, you know, whatever questions, uh, talk to the great composer. Yellow is one third of the size of the red wavelength. You can put three yellow waves inside of one red wave. Green is one fourth of the size of a red wavelength. Two, three, four. Four green waves can crash on the shoreline in the same amount of time that it takes for one red wave to crash on the shoreline. And now we go all the way up. Turquoise is five. One, two, three, four, five. That's pretty good drawing for this little thing. Five waves can crash on the shore in the same time that it takes for one red wave to crash on the shore. And then, we're, so what's happening is as the wavelength decreases, gets smaller, the frequency increases. One, two, three, four, five is more frequent than one. One is slow, five is fast. Now we're going up to six. One, two, three, four, five, six. That is indigo. So we're getting up to this level now of the higher faculties where light and information is starting to move very fast. And the final level in the layer that we can define as human, the spectrum or octave within which we can define as human is violet, which where there's seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven waves of violet can crash on the shoreline in the same amount of time that it takes for one red wave to crash on the shoreline. This is wavelength versus frequency. So when you say like, like something is a high frequency, that means it's moving very fast, it's moving very fast. So all of these are layers of yourself. It's not like, well, who is the violet layer? You are the violet layer. You're also the red layer. You're every layer from red through violet. And now, well, I should go back to my face. You're going back to me. Now we'll do a little bit of music because each one of those colors can also be assigned to a, a note on the scale. And so the scale, uh, on, so on my piano, I want to tilt this down so you can see. Can you see my piano? You're my piano right down here and you can see me. Okay. Hmm. Sorry. C. I am arbitrarily assigning C as red. You could just as easily start with D as red, but in the, so in the Western musical scale, the notes start at C, and I'm saying red starts at C, so we're just arbitrarily assigning these colors. This is literally how I taught myself to play the piano. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. We've done all the notes, and now we're adding up all the light, and the next thing that happens is we go up to the next octave, light. So when we add these notes from here to here, those are the notes that are within the scale that we would call human. All these notes that are down here, we wouldn't define that as human. And all of these notes up here, we also would not define as human. We define as human this slice of reality. These are the human levels or layers of experience. 
All right. So all of this, there's, there's nothing wrong with being human. Being human is totally fun and wonderful and fantastic. What is not cool is when your natural DNA dance is limited or constrained so that the definition of being a human becomes disease, uh, discomfort, suffering, and eventual death. So now I'll answer this question. It's a good question in the chat from Salu, and it's good to see you. Hello. Let me just turn, get myself more comfortable in my chair. So what, what life was like in the time of the immortals before our genes were degraded, before our chakras went askew. So wait, and I should tell this story a little bit better too. So I have said in that drawing that these are like the wheels on a charioteer and that they represent a triumphant charioteer driving their chariot across the great plain that they have conquered. That's what we're supposed to be like. After the genetic squashing, what also happened was a degradation of the chakras. So that instead of us traveling up that center, here you pen instead, bring my pen, going up the center of this sculpture. Remember, I just drew that lower quadrant for anyone who's new, just drew that. What we're supposed to do is travel up the center of this sculpture and have that connection to that convergence point right there. And that's the moment when you recognize, oh, I am God, and then you're God. That's what's supposed to happen. And we're supposed to live as divine beings that know, oh, I am God, of course. Imagine how the world would be and how each one of us would be and how our lives would be different if we walked around as daily, as, in our, as daily creatures thinking, I am God, I am God, I am God, I am God. What if every single person and every single creature and microbe that was here was thinking that and having that realization? We would have a radically transformed society. That's what it was like in Atlantis, the sophisticated worldwide antediluvian or free pre-flood, uh, when I say worldwide, you know, culture that was throughout our whole planet, planet, planetary culture, and also galactic culture. Just like if you live in New York City, you don't just talk to other people in New York City, you talk to people in Hong Kong, Canada, you know, France, wherever you want on the planet. So if you lived on Earth in the sophisticated antediluvian time, you might have lived on Earth, but you could talk with people lots of other places and have a really different experience. Nobody died, everybody ascended because the chakras were not askew. When your chakras go askew, this is like the needle on the record, and I'll draw that for you too. So like if we turn that bottom quadrant, if we turn that upside so that now you're looking at it from the top down, this is just like an old fashioned analog record, right? And the center, that's where the spindle, like you put the needle, uh, you put the record on the record player and you start at the song that's at the outer edge, the outer periphery. And the song of your life spirals inward. And the whole point is when we were designed, we were designed to be able to go directly home, directly to that central convergence point, directly to what would be considered the last song on the album. Instead of having to go through all of these other songs that are all at the periphery, Everything that's at the periphery is a distortion. And so when I draw this cross section again, for anyone who's new in the class, I'm gonna draw this lower cross section again. What happens is either, you could either think of this thing being askew, and this is like the needle. I was saying before the spindle, you know, that's where like you put this on the record player, but the needle, that's like the thing that actually goes around and makes the song of your life. Your needle is the needle of awareness. This is big, it's another big takeaway. So I point to my head up here, this is what I was also speaking about in terms of higher faculties. This is insight, this is your eye of insight, it's your inner eye, and your inner eye is an aperture similar to your physical eyes, but your physical eyes perceive physical light, and your inner eye perceives consciousness. It is the, light, is the eye that we use to look through time so that we can see where we're going. And when, where you put your attention, so attention, this is the first class of the semester. Let's do this properly. Share screen, go to the whiteboard. Give me a moment to work with technology here, everyone. Uh, how do I draw the right things? Here we go, there we go. Attention comes from Greek, attenuos, meaning to attenuate or to reach out for. And that is literally, wait, okay, done. How do I finish this? Oh, hold on. Now I don't know how to get out of this thing. How do I get out of this thing? Stop share. Good. Um, this, I talk about it all the time, is like a tendril. It's a tendril of awareness or like an elephant's trunk, a thing that grows out of your own mind, consciousness, uh, perception, and can go, I use a 
this all the time too and can touch on other things. It's your attention. It reaches out for. So in, in school a long time ago, probably your teacher would be like, tap, 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 class, pay attention, like tap on the board, tap, 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 pay attention. Which literally what that teacher was asking for was, please focus your tendrils of awareness on me and on the information that is on this blackboard. That's what it means to pay attention. Anything that you are focusing or attenuating your, I call it your inner telescope, it's also your inner microscope. So with this telescope, you can reach out, you can look at a far distant star. With this microscope, you can also look within, you can look at the uh, cells of your own body, you can look at the cells of another body. Like if I want to learn about photosynthesis, I use my microscope and I look at a plant and I look at what it's doing. This is literally how I learned about photosynthesis. Whatever you want to learn about, you can learn about. You don't have to read it in a book. P.S. All the information I'm giving you today, I did not read it in a book. I learned it through my attention, through my inner telescope. And the higher faculties, and I'll do this more in a different um, subsequent lesson, the higher faculties work together. This chakra, which is your attention, which is your, um, you know, your imagination, works together with your uh, crown chakra. That this is like getting the library card that gives you access to all the books of the cosmos, but this is like the librarian that actually tells you what books to read and what is salient or useful information for you in that moment. So like if you have a GPS, you know, a, a, a map system for your car, and that map system says, turn right in 10 miles like that's not very helpful or how about this your, your gps system of your car says turn right in 10 years like that is not helpful at all i'm like i need to i need to know what i have to do right now at this intersection right now that is what this violet or highest level of inner guidance the highest note on the human spectrum is able to tell us it is able to tell us what information is important or relevant or salient in this moment. Because if I just opened up somebody's inner eye and I said, there you go, the, 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 the banquet lays out before you. It's like, what do you do first? What do you, what do you access first? What do you learn about first? So in my own personal inner development, this is a language, the language of a, a vibration that I'm teaching here. I learned just like you learn in school. First you learn your ABC is like there are letters. Wait a minute, there are letters that exist, basic shapes that are building blocks. Then the next thing I learned is those letters fit together and they fit together to form words. Wait a minute, these words have a meaning. And then it's just a hop, skip, and a jump away from there to understand that words fit together into sentences and sentences have a meaning. And then it's not that hard to understand. Sentences fit together and they make a paragraph. This is like a paragraph in that language. It's a paragraph, or I like to say it's like a poem because it's not merely it's because it is creative not merely descriptive that there's artistry in here so a poem is a way of sharing information or communicating that is like using words and language and syntax and letters in a creative way that's what flying rainbow lasagna is so all of this is a language p.s this is an empowering lesson where you get to learn this language so that you can drive your own vehicle through time like it's like okay i wanted to say this also I think in a lot of um, a lot of schools, like regular traditional schools, people get very bored and they're like, oh, like that kid's the smart kid. I'm not even going to do the mental arithmetic. I'm just going to let that kid say what's truthful. You know, like the teacher asks, like, what's three plus seven? And you're like, I'm not even going to do the math. Just wait. That kid's going to tell me the answer. Like there's this tendency, I think, in human society to abrogate personal responsibility and just look for someone else like that guy. That, that guy's the pilot. He's going to fly the airplane. I'm just supposed to sit here with my, with my tray down eating my little mini pretzels. Like, no, you are actually meant to be an active participant in life, not merely a you know, strapped in toddler eating mini pretzels. So all of this is about learning this language and becoming literate. And I also, I also call this music theory because all of this is like a music of the cosmos that we're participating in. When you learn music theory, you can become a better musician. When you learn to read the map of time, you can navigate your life circumstances better. And you can also, when you learn to fly in rainbow lasagna, you can write the story so that it's even better, so that it depicts events and things that you enjoy. So once again, 
the former definition of what it is to be human. Oh, to be human is to suffer. To be human is to uh, experience disease and death and the loss of loved ones. That is not the real definition of what it is to be human. The real definition of what it is to be human is to be really a reflection of the divine, like a mini fractal element of a larger divine being. And that we're supposed to be empowered creators or co-creators in this love in this life slash love experiment. So now to answer Salu's question, did the beings of Atlantis ever sleep? The answer is no, or we would have to redefine what sleep is because in this world we define sleep as a time of unconsciousness, like a time of unconsciousness where your daily waking consciousness goes to sleep and then a different aspect of self either processes um, you know, your, your emotional experiences, or for some people that are more, you know, active and more, more focused is able to go on, you know, journeys in a, in a dream world. And you can remember what happened in the dream world. I would say our experiences in Atlantis was more akin to life being a waking dream and the, the, the need to like turn off your brain and sleep and process all that stuff that wasn't necessary because we didn't develop like a backlog during the day here, um, a lot of things are happening. So you're having stimulus, like people are talking to you, things are happening, things are happening. And there's uh, emotional responses that people don't always get a chance to process. And so then uh, they have to take a certain, at a certain point, it's like, I'm tired, I have to close my eyes and I have to process and do inner work of all the stuff that I've been through during the day because you get backlog. You get too much is coming in as opposed to what you can um, energetically metabolize. What if you can metabolize everything in the moment? What if as soon as an experience comes in, you're able to put it through your wheels and have it come out the other side and be like, okay, I get it. I see what's going on. Because I understand that for some people, like you say something to them like, hey, your hair looks nice today. And then they literally, they have to go home and they have to think, what did that guy mean when he said that? What is, what is the significance? What does this mean? And then go through all these inner emotions and then finally come out the other side and be like, oh, okay, now I understand what that experience was and what happened. Like just for a random comment that can be like someone likes your shoes and you have to go home and think about it for 45 minutes like what did they mean where did this come from where is this and the, all that all of that what if you can process it instantaneously that's what it's like when you get your chakras or inner spinning wheels of energy up to speed this is exactly like a bicycle so you know just like i said these are like charioteer wheels when these are moving at an optimum rate the love tone as we move through time, then they're um, metabolizing in a very good way. Energy comes into it and energy comes out of it and you don't get energetic backlog. So that means that you're not constantly um, getting new experiences that you then have to digest. Literally, this is what adipose tissue extra body fat is all about. That when people pile on many, many, many pounds, like if a person is 100 pounds overweight or whatever, not meant, meaning to be offensive to anyone, it is the accumulation of undigested emotional experiences. Not only foods that they have ingested, but also thoughts and feelings and interactions with other people. And this is the uh, value of doing a pilgrimage. Pilgrimage means lots and lots and lots of walking. So some of the pilgrimages of the Middle Ages, like across Europe, they would just walk extremely long distances. In some places in the Far East, they will perambulate, go around, like go around a mountain, walk around that mountain twice, 27 times, and then get back to me. Like this is what your guru would tell you. Walk around that mountain 27 times, then get back to me. And what, what happens when you do a lot of cardiovascular uh, activity like that is the extra accumulated emotional um, uh, residues get digested. And so while, what is, what's a person's mind doing while they're doing those boring perambulations and going walking around in circles? They're getting rid of or shedding the backlog and accumulation that has come uh, on top of them in the past. So yes, running and walking and cycling and perambulating, these are all very effective ways of uh, you know, rectifying, it's like doing the dirty laundry. Like you got a lot of dirty laundry. It's hard to be free when you've got all of that stuff weighing you down. It's a way of being more free and not being weighed down. Once you get your metabolism up to speed, like a bicycle, if it's going very slow, the wheels are going very slow. If it's going very slow, it falls over really easily. The chakra wobbles. And if it wobbles, what I, because of what I was trying to say, I think I jump around a lot. I'm trying to be more focused. Apologize. Apologize if I jump around too much. This is the needle of awareness that plays the song of your life. Either you could think of this as remaining in alignment and your chakra wobbles. And if it does, then you hit the membrane of death. 
or you could think of this as remaining stable and this is the thing that ends up wobbling. Either way, this is supposed to be in a perfect alignment with this so that you reach that feeling of uh, being God, of divine union with God. And what is, instead happens is things go wobbly, things go askew, and this is what leads to decrepitude and like basically loss of momentum and death, which is where your genes can't even jump your consciousness from one time in one, one box of time into the next box of time. Wait, I need to drink more water. Running a marathon, running a marathon. Uh, Brandon is making a very lovely statement. I'm going to read it out loud because everybody can't, um, can't see the chat in the recording. He says, Aurora is an awesome example of unconditional love. Thank you. Um, attenuating with her absolutely expands your own capacity for the unconditional love. So I love, thank you very much for saying that. And this gives me an opportunity to describe more about love. Love is literally a food. So, and here, this is also how I can understand and describe my personal experience being here as Aurora, being a walk-in, sharing flying rainbow lasagna. When our genes, blah, 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 we are musicians of our DNA and your genes are making a song and it's being sent out to other people. So like, okay, we're playing a song. And I know I'm playing a song. Guess what? Everybody's playing a song. Now I'll make horrible music. Some people play a song like this. That's their song. They're allowed to play that song. It's a crappy song. We, I think we all agree that's not music. M music is defined as organized sound waves and we consider things that sound organized you know to in, in the right way to be pretty in our ears like oh like that sounds so pretty because the sound waves are organized and when they're not organized that is not pretty my ears can tell me that's not organized so unconditional love is literally a tone type of music that we play with our bodies and when it when you make that music you send it out to others it affects other people they feel it. They're being fed by it. You're doing it right. It's we're all feeding each other. And this is how we're supposed to nourish and inspire and uplift one another. So it's just a big thing. Like I also talk about in Atlantis, we didn't eat physical food. Like, no, you didn't like whatever, grind up things with your mouth parts and put them into your tummy. That's not how food happened. Food happened by sun gazing, connecting directly to the sun and the stellar network. And we were also fed by our environment. And that includes the plants, the animals, the minerals, the other people around us. So we can feed each other. And this is what I always am attempting to do with my music. I'm sending out this genetic vibration, this genetic music that is intended to be a food. That's why the word lasagna is very apt to nourish other people. And it's not unidirectional, it's bi-directional. I send out music and then other people send out their music to me. This is the way it's supposed to be. This is like, because the definition of love, real unconditional love, it's an equal giving and receiving. It's the tone that is made when an equal amount of giving out is coming in. So now you can understand that in terms of, oops, sorry, just moving around here, metabolism. Like metabolism, a person gets fatter if more comes in than goes out. And everybody wants a fat bank account. Like you want that to happen to your bank account, right? But then everybody wants their body to do more than what they're eating, they expend more calories than what they're eating so you have a slender body. But real love is a balance. It is a, a homeostasis where the same amount of of energy that you're eating, like you're drinking the smoothie while you're running and doing exercise at the same time, and then you maintain your happy, healthy physical structure. So this is the whole idea that love is meant to be something you send out to other people, and then other people send love back to you. And it is this, um, you know, mutual rapport, just like in music. You know, someone else plays a note and it affects you and then you play a note and it affects them. This is beautiful. This is, this is cosmic lovemaking. So again, this is not at the level of orange emotions, mammalian romantic partnership. This is at the level of green, which is unconditional love. So you can do this type of cosmic lovemaking with a microbe. You cannot have sex and procreate with a microbe, okay? You cannot be romantically involved with a microbe. It's not that level of relationship. Same thing with like a redwood tree or the, the stars in the sky. Like this is a um, higher level of love than 
the mammalian procreative emotion, which is what most people think about, like the romantic comedy level of love. So this is a different level that, that we're talking about. So Nicole was asking me, wondering what my, what my perspective is on dreaming. So I'm not an excellent dreamer. And so my, my personal experiences with having um, neurological deficits and uh, nocturnal seizures and other problems like that, I have not... Um, develop the muscles of being a really excellent lucid dreamer. Like when I go to sleep, like I'm happy to sleep and achieve unconsciousness and wake up well rested in the morning. I'm not adept in that way. So I don't pretend to be able to teach other people to do something that I myself cannot do. I would say if you're interested in lucid dreaming and cultivation on those levels to talk to another teacher because it's not my expertise, just like healing physical bodies is not my expertise. I literally I had to learn about having a human body. I had to learn about nutrition and exercise and gut health and all those things. Like I'm, I'm new to all this. I've had to have other people teach me about how to have a healthy body. So I don't pretend to teach anybody else like how to heal your body. My expertise is these empirical ideas. These, um, it's like a, a math language, but it's fun math. And sharing these ideas that that is a healing of the, of the mental body. So like, again, when I do this class, I present all the things that I feel confident in um, my, I keep checking my time too, in my ability to present so that you know that I, like, I wouldn't just be shining you on. I would, and I will never say, if you ask me something that, that I don't know about, I'd be like, oh, sure, I know that. You just, I, don't, I don't make stuff up either. So if I don't know, I really will tell you, I really don't know. And sometimes people come to me with wonderful ideas or insight that I recognize that is also part of love. I send out my quality lasagna, my food to other people. And someone else might be like, my garlic bread will taste wonderful with your lasagna. And I'm like, yes, like that is how you make a meal. That is good food. Okay, um, Pedro is saying, I might be jumping into later classes. Can we make a Merkaba around the Ascension timeline inside the time field to protect it? Yes, absolutely, we can do that. I, I love this way of thinking. So, well, Merkaba stuff is level two. So that'll be in a few minutes. So Pedro, like, bookmark that question and I'll respond to it more fully with all the images that I have prepared for in level two. Okay, so wait, drinking more water. Level one, this is what, what we're doing here. Understanding that each one of us has not only a physical body, that inside of the physical body we've got DNA that are the strings of the guitar that emit non-physical vibrations and that those non-physical vibrations are the time field and what we have around us. Yes, there's a huge connection between your DNA and time. I have to affirm this um, because so many people think that DNA is just about like what color is your eye? What is the shape of your earlobe? Like, you know, what, what, you know, how many fingers do you have on your hand? Your DNA is so much more than just a blueprint for the physical expression of proteins in your physical body. Your DNA and its dance is literally what propels you through time. So when you, uh, learn to be a virtuoso of your DNA, then you can more easily and effectively direct your journey through time and not have to hit the membrane of death. So now let me go to whiteboard. So for anyone who's new, let's start from the beginning. Cause I understand it's gotta be super frustrating if you're like jumping on board in the middle of what I'm talking about and then it doesn't even make sense. So I'm trying to start from the beginning so that it won't be frustrating for anyone who's coming on board new and for anyone who's been here for a while this is all recap and I'm sure you feel very comfortable like with with all the things that I'm presenting that lower quadrant of the yellow sculpture this is the time vortex it's a vortex because it's actually you know shaped with a circular shape just like my sculptures three-dimensional right but I am drawing these just like shorthand um, diagrams so that we have a common language I draw this little diagram all the time. And what we have, and I know that's not the neatest version of it, but so this understood is a cross section of something that is actually three dimensional, but I'm making it look flat. And all the, let me change colors, all of the timelines themselves actually wrap around like this, but it's hard to draw them accurately if I show them in the, those spirals. So what I do is I show them as starting down here at the bottom and moving upward like arrows, or uh, you know, here starting down here, it's just a little bit hard to control my pen sometimes. Starting down at the bottom and then moving upward as arrows, and then sometimes you might also see me making lollipops, which are these little dots over here. You've done this journey, this you know spiral journey up the timeline, and then you end up at the dot, and the dot is on this membrane over here 
that is the membrane of death. So in this diagram over here that I just drew, let's talk about what each of these things are that I just drew. So this area that I'm highlighting in red, that is a flowing membrane, just like a waterfall. It flows in this direction of the arrow. It flows in this direction of the arrow. Um, it is flowing time, just like water, making a waterfall is the flowing of water. This is water flowing through a membrane, sorry, time flowing through a membrane, making that a membrane of time. And it's meant to be a membrane uh, where you know, nobody lives, where consciousness does not exist. But since the genetic squashing, humans have been exploring all sorts of things that happen on the membrane of death. This is why I say death is the aberration. You're not supposed to hit the membrane of death. So wait, let me choose a different color here. This uh, line that I'm highlighting in bright green over here, this is called the path of least likelihood. Least likelihood because there's only one timeline of that uh, possibility in the entire time vortex. So now I'm drawing the time vortex from the top down, just like I showed you before. It is like an old fashioned analog record, like from the 1970s. And everything that I'm highlighting in the blue color, in the, in the margins, in the periphery, those are all peripheral timelines. They're all, so th those would be, you know, everything that's over here where I'm scribbling with blue, see everything to the left, everything to the right, uh, and everything that's here where I'm also scribbling in blue. Those are meant to be timelines that are not actually experienced. So in the time of Atlantis, nobody went on any of those peripheral timelines over here. Those are all the timelines where you die. Some of those timelines you die immediately after you're born. So in here, if I just rewind a little bit, rewind, there we go. So let's say the needle of awareness begins over here at the very, very edge, the very, very periphery. And you have to start spiraling inward to get towards that green central path of least likelihood. There's first of all, a very, very high degree of probability that you will experience something in the blue zone. Let's say there's a 99% here, so can I even write 99? 99% chance that you will experience death in this area that I'm scribbling over, 99%. But let's say there's only a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of a possibility that you will actually, like an uh, expert archer, hit the center of the bullseye on the very first attempt to hit that center. That, that takes an expert, that takes a virtuoso. So that is why it's the path of least likelihood. There is a low probability of being able to do that. So this has to do with possibilities. This is a field of possibilities. Lots of different things can happen, but the probability of what will happen. So since the genetic squashing, when humans have not been in control of their flight through time, they have to experience every single possible wrong experience before they get to the wormhole out of here, the path of least likelihood, which you would also describe as the ascension timeline. And Pedro is asking me, can we put a Merkaba of protection here? I'm now drawing a very stick figure of a Merkaba of protection around that timeline so they can get to it. And the big fat answer is yes. And we'll talk about that more in level two. And I like the way you're thinking. Um, up until this point, genetic squashing, everybody has been flying blind. So it's like you have to try out every wrong note. If we're going for this note up here, then it's like having to do, well, first let's try this note. No, not right, not right, not right. No, 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 no. Death, 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 death. Oh, we finally found the doorway out of here, but only after trying out the 87 wrong keys on the piano, after trying out every single possible wrong combination of thoughts and ideas and behaviors and events in that is what leads to the membrane of death. That basically humans not being in control of their DNA, not being able to use their higher faculties to see through time and use the steering wheel of consciousness to choose which timeline they experience means that they have to experience every single one of these timelines. And all of these timelines, you can see what I'm talking about, they end in death. So I usually make this down here, a little zero, like we're starting at birth and then time moves forward in this direction. And the longer the timeline over here, the longer the life. So I just drew a line that might've been like whatever, 50 or 60 or 75 years. And these little short lines over here that I'm drawing at the edge, maybe you lived for a day. So this is how we understand this um, diagram that I'm always drawing in class. This is for the first, first introduction to class and um, the, the subsequent ideas, like this is a foundation idea to build upon. The idea that when you were first born, 
um, every one of us died instantaneously. Like maybe the umbilical cord was wrapped around your throat or too much blood or whatever, a bomb exploded, something happened, you died instantaneously. And then what happened was you hit the membrane of death over here where I'm making a blue dot and you circulated back around and assembled at the next possible position and then began your flight through time again. And that time you were born, but you were born slightly differently, different trajectory, but maybe you lived for a day and then somebody dropped you on your head or whatever happened, you know, you breathed in a microbe in the wrong way and you died. And then you hit the membrane of death over here and you have to go back and circulate back around. And this happens so many times that it's almost uncountable. We have all died 10 million billion times. And this whole membrane of death where I'm scribbling is filled up with the residue or the, uh, they're like the term papers, the versions of your term paper that weren't quite right, that you had to keep editing. So every time you hit the membrane of death, it's like, oh, you tried to hand in the paper, your term paper to the professor and the professor rejected it. Like, no, you had misspellings, go back and fix it. No, you didn't do your grammar right, go back and fix it. That's what all this is. It is an en not endless, but seemingly endless um, uh, uh, trial and error. And I understand that this is why so many people feel that they don't like the chakra system or they don't like the rainbow system or they don't like any of these things. It's not intended to be something that holds you back or constrains you. However, I understand that that's the way the experience has been, much like the movie Groundhog's Day, where Bill Murray is stuck in a repeating time loop of one day and he has to keep trying different things to get out of that one day. This is the repeating time loop of a life where you have to keep on trying and trying and trying and trying and trying. And just to make it really clear for anyone who's new to my method of diagramming, you know, these loops, these endless time loops, they, they circle in from both sides because this is a cross section. So, you know, it's, I, it's not just from this side where I'm scribbling, it's from both sides at the same time. So the idea is that each one of us experiences an almost uncountable number of deaths. And those are what the red lollipops are over here on the membrane of death. Call those your last moments. Use what I'm pointing out with this red arrow. It's your final moment, your final denouement. Like if this is the movie of your life, that's the last scene here, the last scene, you know, like where the guy kisses the girl or the, the, the you know, uh, building explodes or the plane lands or the guy rides off into the sunset on his horse. Like it's the last moment of your life. And by implication, a lot of this is about math. Um, the last moment of your life by implication contains all of the events that led to that moment because you had to have been born and gone through all of these experiences, had a life trajectory, and then you got to that moment where you actually died. So I use the example like if this is your last moment over here, you jumped out of a plane on your birthday, it's supposed to be a fun parachute exhilaration, but instead your parachute didn't open and you died. So this timeline over here that leads up to that moment includes you're not only being born and your schooling and your education and self-development, but also the idea that a friend gave you a ticket to go do your skydiving and that you chose to take the ticket and chose to get on the plane, you chose to do that. And that is what led to that particular version of death. All of these other little red dots are versions of you that might have chosen to drive their car on the highway and they got smashed by a truck or they might have had space debris fall on their head, blue ice from a floating, you know, flying by uh, airplane fell on your head and killed you. Any of the most great, greatest unlikelihoods of death or very high likelihoods like driving a car, just drinking water. And the whole point is we were not designed to die. That's a gene an expectation, go back to my face. You were not designed to die. That is an expectation that comes into us with the implantation of the human operating system, which is a hacked operating system. So when you're a little baby, you're born here and you come, you come in, you know, in this beautiful uh, physical body and you don't know about death. And it actually takes um, education from other people that have been here for a longer amount of time to teach you about death. So maybe your goldfish dies and you're like, mommy, daddy, where's goldfish? And they say, oh, goldfish went bye-bye. Or maybe it's grandma, where's grandma? Grandma went bye-bye. Like at a certain point in early childhood, everybody is taught the concept of death. And as soon as, because epigenetics, as soon as you are taught the concept of death, your DNA goes from one particular dance where it's dancing the dance of eternal life. I'm going to live forever. I'm a little tiny kid. I'm going to live forever. And all of a sudden you get 
get schooled about death, then all of a sudden the dance movements change and the expectation becomes this body will eventually die. It's a software program. It's not necessarily a truth, like an empirical truth of life but it's something that is so pervasive that we are taught about as such an inevitability that everyone takes it as if it is the basic truth. But I'm teaching everyone, no, death is the aberration, the thing that is not supposed to exist. It's like driving your car off the road. What you're supposed to do is drive your car on the road and keep driving it for infinity, in, for eternity. Pardon me. That is what happens when you do that central core timeline, the path of least likelihood. You actually keep your car on the road. You don't veer wildly off into the guardrails and then you know drive off a cliff. That is what death is. So becoming a virtuoso of DNA means that you continue your flight through time. Your consciousness continues to go through time. It doesn't stop. When you hit the membrane of death, your consciousness stops moving through time. All right? And I'm going to get, this is almost the end of level one recording. I think I've done good work here. I'm going to get into in subsequent presentations, how the flying rainbow lasagna allows us to rearrange the information on the membrane of death into a new format or make it no longer necessary for us to explore every single possibility of death before we find the, the, the possibility that is one of uh, infinite life. Let me go to the chat though before I end this level of the recording. Um, Pedro says, next time someone hits the membrane, I will say they went back to try again. That is exactly what is happening with all of us. And another big part of that, that, um, that vortex that I'm always drawing, the peripheral versions of you, like where I have my pen over here, these peripheral areas, those are distortions of persona and character as well. So it's not only that on those timelines you die, like I use the examples of having your umbilical cord wrapped around your neck or pathogen or being dropped on your head. There are also versions of you that are horribly distorted where you might be a psychopath. And it might be hard to envision that because all the people in my class are lovely, beautiful, loving people that are not you know, psychopathic or any monsters or anything like that, but that to understand that is what the peripheral timelines are. They are versions of self that are so distorted that they cannot be even considered in many ways to be your true self. And that's what I mean when you say like you go to hand in your term paper to the professor and the professor looks at it as like, this is full of misspellings. Go back, try again. Like this is not right. So if, if you are the version of self where you're a psychopath, like a maniac, where you're like, you know, you're stabbing people and shooting people like that is not your true self. That is not the characteristics of your true self. You are horribly awry. And I've used the example of my little dog. She's sleeping in the background somewhere. Um, you know, she's super sweet and wonderful. And she licks up and she jumps, jumps up and she licks my face and she gives me kisses. So you can tell she's super, super loving. But on her peripheral timelines, you know, she might have had to like fight for her life in some crazy Mad Max survival, escape from LA type of thing. And she's, you know, like a snarling pit bull and she has to, you know, try to bite other people in order to stay alive. Like that's a distortion of her basic persona. That's not who she is on the basic level. So the idea is it's not just that your life is cut short and it's drink more water it is also that your basic sense of self and your persona is distorted who you really are on a basic level is not being expressed effectively on those peripheral timelines part of it might be that we, you know, if someone amputated your arms and legs and you were meant to be a, you know, an athlete or a dancer, then you couldn't be an athlete or a dancer because you didn't have arms and legs. That's part of it. But part of it could be, what if you were so horribly tormented and abused? Like, what would it take to, to, to take my beautiful little dog and turn her into some kind of, you know, Mad Max escape from Thunderdome type of uh, dog? Well, it would take like, like, you know, like a horrible abuse and torment and a fight for survival. Like each one of us can be on a timeline where you might be, instead of your normal, loving, you know, well-grounded person that you are, you might be like, oh, I better kill that guy before he kills me. Like, like let me get my battle axe. Let me chop, slash and hack, hack and slash. Like that, there are versions of you that are like that. And it's because that is your response to context in on those timelines that you have created. But those are not the true versions of you. There's the highly distorted versions of you. So, all right. Roxanne says, I'm sure there are people that are walking around that are very, very old, but have to keep silent. That's an interesting idea too. You know, I do, I do I'm not a biblical literalist, but I do think about the um, stories of the early part of the Bible, like the Old Testament, where it talks about some of these beings like 
Moses or Enoch that lived to four or five or 700 years old. And I truly think that that is nothing. I think it's even at the low end of what is the genetic potential for our bodies. First of all, not being exposed to why fry, yes, I said fry, all of this why fry, these errant electromagnetic fields. Hello, that's why I drink out of my shungite cup. For anyone who's new and people who already know me, so you see me drinking out of this all the time. This is a mineral called shungite that can help very much in mitigating errant EMF fields. These are like the antithesis of good music. That's like beautiful genetic music that I told you in Atlantis, our environment fed us. We fed each other, fed with love, fed with uh, crystals, fed with plants and animals around us. When we have these horrible smart meters and Wi-Fi and all of that, it's the literal antithesis of having an environment that feeds you with vitality. It takes down your vitality. So there's none of that is by accident. We're literally, you know, living in this heck hole trying to make things better but we like don't worry because we can fly in rainbow lasagna and there's solutions but please do recognize that there are uh, great difficulties so yes our bodies have this inner inner potential to be oh my goodness dog boss just arrived come on up come on up come on up oh now you guys can see who i'm talking about which going to like my chair lip gloss. I know it. So this is cheeky. She's super wonderful and loving. She definitely is not a Mad Max fight for survival, snarling dog trying to kill everybody and bite them all. And she's quite, quite the opposite. She's really wonderful and super loving. So it would take a lot for her to have to be, you know, running around, biting people's faces off, fighting for survival. That's not the real version of who she is. That's not her real self. So that is one way to understand when we see people with psychopathic, violent behavior. They are peripheral versions of self. They are not mm, expressing mm, their true selves at all. Oh my goodness, I need those hugs. Thank you. So we need to wrap up for level one and move on to level two, where we're going to talk all about the connection of chakras to the Merkava. And these are not just cool, you know, whatever, edgy words to use. They're actual things that, that describe actual things. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So this is just level one, the introduction. Like I said, it's not a, a journey where we are learning overnight to be virtuoso musicians. Like you're not just going to press a button and all of a sudden be Mozart. It takes time to learn how to be flying rainbow lasagna. And I also say this all the time. I'm the first or the innovator of this flying rainbow lasagna concept, but I'm not the only one. Like I'm literally here on earth doing this work and happily, joyfully sharing this idea so that all of us can become better musicians. Upgrade your DNA and upgrade your DNA that doesn't just um, roll in my eyes here. Like, cause I know I read all these things where I'm like, oh, they're just talking about upgrade your DNA. What exactly are you doing? So I'm not coy either. Like this is an actual dance. It's just like saying, here's a piano. You know, as soon as you get your piano and you take it home, it's like, are you an instant perfect player? Like, no, it takes time. You got to practice. So here's your lasagna. Here's your lasagna to play with, but it takes time to practice it and figure out how to do it right. So this is just the first lesson. And now it's time to internalize and process everything you've heard in this lesson and then return next week. So what I do, and I just, for anyone who's in this class, you already know this, I have recorded recorded lessons that are on an interactive whiteboard that are like the textbook for what I'm presenting here. And those lessons, you know, I, there's only one hour and I'm responding in the chat and I'm more conversational here. So there's always things that I don't get to. I'm like, oh, I wish I could have remembered to say that. It's in the recorded lessons. And a student contacted me today and said, oh yes, the recorded lessons help make your live webinars make so much more sense. So if you're, content, if you're watching the archive of this and you're not already enrolled in the class, check out the links in the comments. And I've got the enrollment links with a lessons enabled for free preview. And this is not an advertisement. Scroll down, you see the free lessons. First of all, you can learn stuff from the free lessons and lesson one is enabled. And then you can also get an, more of an idea of how that more methodical, organized presentation of information um, helps to um, uh, give more backstory to what I'm talking about here. So this is just the end of le lesson one, um, level one. Let me get on to level two. And thank you so much to everyone who has been participating.